Thanks for listening to this archive of Teaching American History's Saturday webinar for Saturday, the 5th of February, 2022. This is the second in our Populous and Progressive series for the spring of 2022, and today's focus was Populists, Progressives, and Political Economy. We were joined, as always, by our moderator, Dr. Chris Burkett of Ashland University, Dr. David Alvis of Wofford College, and Dr. Jennifer Keene of Chapman University. Thanks for listening. Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to another TeachingAmericanHistory.org Saturday webinar sponsored by the Ashburg Center at Ashland University. TAH.org is the leading online resource for the documents-based study of American history, government, and civics for teachers, students, and citizens. I'm Chris Burkett. I'm a professor of political science um, and also director of uh, an undergraduate program here called the Ashburg Scholar Program at Ashland University. Now this spring semester and our webinars, we're drawing inspiration for, uh, from Ashbrook's Populists and Progressives Documents Collection, edited by Jason Jividen. And you can access all of the documents in this collection for free at tah.org or purchase them in paperback format for a very, very reasonable price. For those of you joining us for the first time, let me just explain that the point of these webinars is to bring together some uh, very thoughtful and knowledgeable scholars and to have a conversation about um, important questions regarding populists and progressives. And we encourage all of you joining us today to participate in our conversation by submitting questions in the Q&A function. And as always, we will try to get to as many of those as possible. In the next week, you'll receive a link uh, in an email uh, by which you can request a certificate of participation. And it will also include a link to the archived video and audio from today's program. So today our topic is populist progressives and political economy. And I'm very, very happy to introduce our panelists for today. Uh, David Alvis of Wofford College is returning again uh, to help us think these things through. And I'm very pleased to welcome Jennifer Keene of Chapman University this morning. Thanks to both of you for being here. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. <clears throat> so I like to start with just a very broad open-ended question so that you, you guys can you know, take in any direction you want. but. Um, the title of our talk today is uh, Populist Progressives and Political Economy. So, um, so, so how, do we, how do we tie those three things together? Can we, can we start maybe by talking about who were the populists, what distinguishes them from progressives or vice versa, what's the relationship between them? And then um, obviously another big question we want to discuss uh, this morning is what was the effect of populists and, and progressives on economy, uh, economic thought, policy, regulation um, in the United States, especially going into the 20th century. So how do we start thinking about populists versus progressives? Anybody want to start? Jennifer, do you mind? Sure, I'll start. Um, well, I would say that in a, in a real sense, what both the populists, I mean, obviously the populists sort of precede the, the progressives in a kind of chronological way, but one of the things that they're both concerned about is the way in which the conditions of modern economic life have changed, that the rules of the game have changed. And they've changed because of large um, uh, economic you know, corporations or entities, whether it be railroads, whether it be um, you know, steel um, monopolies, have really um, changed the ways in which uh, a, a working class person and even a middle-class person can aspire to rise and fulfill the American dream. And I think that there is a sense that because the economic rules of the game have changed because of these powerful entities, they're proposing um, new ways for the government to intervene, whether it be in the agricultural economy, which is really where the populists rise and where they get you know, most of their most of their ideas and their base, or the progressives, which tend to be focusing on um, national problems, but especially urban problems, and to be thinking about the ways that this can be addressed. And I would just, I guess one thing I'll just toss out right from the beginning is that because we look back at these movements from a 21st century perspective, our assumption is that when we say they see a new role for the government, we automatically mean the federal government. But in many ways, they're also proposing new roles for local government, for state government. And, and you know, we tend to you know, shorthand it a lot for the national legislation that they push forward, but we should never lose sight of the fact that we're not 
yet to the point where everybody looks automatically to Washington for for answers to these problems. That's my opening gambit. That's a that's a really important point. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I, I just want to reiterate Jennifer's very articulate description of what kind of unifies the populace and the progressives. Right, and that is this, this, this increasing inequality of wealth, but also too, it's the um, the levers of political power have radically changed, right? So that uh, you have these monopolies, right? That can exert enormous political influence um, uh, throughout the country. And so th both at the state level and at the federal level. So this, that really disturbs them both. The, in some ways, we, what distinguishes the populace and the progressives are two very different answers to what to do about this situation. Um, so the prayer, the populists are essentially a sort of uh, agrarian uprising. Um, they predominantly tend to be right uh, Western farmers. That's at least where the strongest base is. Uh, and you see that among the constituencies that support people like uh, William Jennings Bryan or um, from our readings, right, uh, James Weaver. And um, they're, they seem to uh, object primarily to the control that elites have over politics. So you'll, you'll notice that they have a very populist rhetoric. It's a, we need to restore the powers of government away from the elites back into the hands of the people. Um, that's really different from the progressives, right? The progressives are, uh, in fact, see the elite as a critical means, right, of restoring democracy. Uh, from both the inequalities and from the political corruption uh, of the party machines and the wealthy elite. And that is what they're very comfortable with the idea of expert elites, right, running uh, government. And, um, you know, and also to the government having a much more uh, 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 strong, a much stronger role and more active role in direct intervention in the economy. Whereas the populace Right. Sometimes they were comfortable, for instance, with public ownership of railroads, but they didn't really see the federal government as the primary solution. And so this is for this reason, populists often would blend into the Democratic Party and its emphasis on states rights, whereas the progressives really emphasized a stronger centralized federal government managed by elite experts uh, who can um, who can control the reins of the economy and regulate it in a manner that's fair uh, for all citizens. So, sorry, Jennifer, please go ahead. I was just gonna say that, and you can see that um, even in something like the Jane Addams reading that we have, how that percolates down to the local level where it's not just about, again, the federal legislation, but the idea that, you know, if you live in a, in a, in a, rundown area of the city if your local garbage collector is not doing their job as they've been contracted by the city government you have to have an ability to intervene and do something about that but that but that idea for the progressives of expertise and you know who who is who is the right person to devise the solutions there is definitely an, an uneasiness with the sense of just giving that over to the populace because there's a sense the populace can be easily misled that they may not be educated they might not be assimilated and there is this love in the progressive movement of expertise right a lot of data collection sociology is coming out as a new field and it's this idea that you can study a problem you can create data and you can devise a solution and there there is definitely um it's a sense of elitism but a new elitism it's not the old uh, you know uh, um inherited wealth sort of the way it's always been or, or certainly not the monopolist but it's this new class of of people who believe in science they believe in data they believe in experts and and a lot of their reforms even in getting rid of government corruption sort of tend in that direction. And I would argue that at a certain point, the progressives are actually in opposition to the populists because some of the things that the populists um, are proposing are actually what they fear. Um, and <laughs> <laughs> too much power to the people, I guess. <laughs> yeah, that, that's really well said, because if you look at the populists, right, the, the populists really are populists. And <laughs> in some ways, right, they always want a sort of silver bullet solution, yeah. right? And so if you look at the populists, they tend to be com mostly composed of people who were part of the Greenback Party 
or who are silverites. You know, if you just if you just somehow loosen up the um, uh, uh, the currency, get it off the gold standard, then right, then you then everything will be okay. So they love yeah. silver bullet solutions because that's what you know average people can understand. And the progressives really saw this as a pro as a sort of illustration of the problem of democracy in general. And that is, you know, it's very hard to have democratic means towards democratic ends um, because ultimately, right, the people always want some sort of simple panacea, right, to, uh, to f fix all of their, all of their problems. A, a movie that is a great illustration, uh, you know, a book and a, later a movie, uh, there's a great illustration of this is The Wizard of Oz, right? So, <laughs> I mean, the, you've got all of the characters from the populist era. You've got your Western farmer represented by the scarecrow. Uh, you got William Jennings Bryan is represented by the lion, comes out with a big roar, but turns out to be rather ineffectual. You got your tin man, your northern industrialist, and the, um, the yellow brick road, right, of course, is the, uh, is the gold standard. And if you can just come up with a simple solution, right, to getting us off this gold standard. So originally the, the slippers, right, are not ruby red slippers, but rather silver slippers. And then this will fix all of our problems. <laughs> that's great. That's, that's popular. That's, a, that's great. That's fantastic. But there's, um, there is, um, it, what kind of, I was thinking about the leadership and maybe this is tied to the, to the, to the democratic problem. Uh, is there is there a kind of formal leadership to, to the populace? It seems to me that there's there's some uneasy disagreement uh, or tension, if you will, between um, people there that are mainly there representing agricultural interests and then sort of labor, right? Am I am I right in remembering this that uh, that the, the populists have to somehow form this coalition, but that there's some not necessarily you know they're they're sort of in the same camp but they don't necessarily like each other or agree uh, or am i exaggerating this too much the sort of the tension between labor and, and agriculture yeah they 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 had a really hard time disciplining uh, creating a disciplined party in opposition to the two major parties at the time uh, and so what you see them trying to do right and and james weaver was a big part of this right was they would constantly try and form these fusion tickets but the problem is, is that they're trying to form a, an umbrella party for a whole bunch of single issue parties. And they don't really have a formula for why any of these groups to get together other than we're trying to win this election. And you can see right, with Weaver, right, the biggest problem they have, and this is true with William Jennings Bryan, is making any appeal to labor in the Northeast. Um, what, you know, why does labor want to be part of this, right? They don't really have an answer for what is the connection between labor and agrarian interests. And this is primarily because and at the end of the day, they tend to be um, a fairly single issue uh, party. And the other, the other is, is that they don't really have a broader vision, right? For what the, um, for, for what the reforms are that are necessary uh, to achieve a more equitable estate. And I would add that they have the problem of the South because populism is also strong in the South initially because a lot of the exploitative issues around railroads and um, and about um, fair market value for crop prices. I mean, this this affects people in the South as well. But if you go into the South, you know, when you're dealing with a tenant sharecropping system, and also, you know, this is the moment at which we're starting to see the institutionalization of Jim Crow, a populist party then has to say, well, if we're really interested in power for the people, we want to make agrarian interests like a real, you know, power block in this country. Well, to do that, we also need black voters. And are we willing to go to the to the extent of supporting, you know, or or I guess opposing the the the, the trend, which is the disenfranchisement of black voters in this era? So, the, so also they're sort of undermined in you know typical American fashion, where you know race can become the the card that opposing interests can play to divide and conquer. And I mean, I think that it hurts the labor movement in this period, you know, in terms of race and ethnic ethnic. Race, racial and ethnic divisions and definitely in the South as well. And so, so you do see when it's farmer alliances, which again are kind of locally based in the South, sort of small efforts to actually create integrated movements, but that falls apart. And then by the time you get to Tom Weaver with the populist movement, that's 
that's done. It's become a white supremacist party. And then that's an easy connection to a Democratic Party, which is leading the way to turn, you know, the solid South into a Jim Crow um, region. So it so it is also important how, you know, racial racial divisions then kind of trump economic um, unity. And this is where it's interesting in here. I I like some of these readings in the way that they're so explicit about class as class as being something that exists in America, it's a way to self-identify. But of course, most people in the, in, in, in the nation are gonna first identify as white and then maybe working class and then working class. And that's or Irish and then working class or during you know, all the different, all the ways in which Americans are balkanized in this period. And so creating a real class identity, which is what the populists begin tr with, that's what they begin with because they're seeing that the, the mechanization, the loss of land ownership, the ways in which working in agriculture is in itself an industrialized process now. So let's borrow the language of class that you know the union, the labor movements use. It doesn't, it doesn't stick because it's so easy to go in and be able to exploit all these other cultural divisions or, or you know, perceptive, perceived divisions that people have with each other. And that, I mean, that's always one of the, um, and the labor movement suffers from exactly the same, the same things. And so the one group that doesn't suffer from this is the monopolists. <laughs> <laughs> they have a very strong sense of class identity, so they succeed. <laughs> That's a great point. That's a great point. Well, and it also, to the 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 issue about race in the South, right? That Jennifer mentioned is really uh, uh, an important illustration of kind of what's wrong with the populace, and that is because the populists don't have really a solid intellectual foundation. You know, it tends to be a kind of battle among demagogues for leadership. And so who can ever, whoever can out demagogue the other person, right, you know, usually ends up in the leadership position. And so the, the problem is, is that the, the uh, especially when it came to race, you know, the Western agrarian farmers like Brian and Weaver are not really interested in creating, you know, racial divisions or anything like that. But when they, when they try to travel down south, right, they get out demagogued very quickly on the race issue. So you get people like Tom Watson in Georgia or uh, uh, Ben Tillman right in South Carolina that you know can easily out, you know, outrun them because they know how to demagogue the issue. And so when you don't have a strong intellectual base, you get these kind of demagogic figures. The other thing too about the populace that they wrongly assumed was that it is true that at this time, still most Americans, uh, the lar uh, largest portion of the population, the majority of the population is engaged in agrarian uh, 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 labor. But the thing is, is that agrarian labor is not the same throughout the country. So Western agrarianism is way different than Southern agrarianism. And so it doesn't, it doesn't lend itself to a natural and coherent uh, voting uh, a base. And so that's that the populace never got. Yeah, those are great points. And we've been, there are two, uh, we've got a number of good questions who've come in, which have come in here. And we've been talking about, I think, addressing Adam's question, how, how did the populace and progressives, we haven't got to the progressives yet, but how did the populace organized network form a movement and become a national presence? And we've been talking about the challenges that they faced in actually accomplishing those things. So um, the, the populace as a movement, um, what, what, how long did that last? About eight years, maybe 10, or was it longer than that, would you say? Yeah, I mean, in terms of as, as a, you know, active political party, probably about, probably about 10 years. 10 years. And, okay. and yeah, there, I mean, their organizational structure was basically those farmers alliances. Yeah. Um, you know, Grange and, and Western right. Farmer Alliance and things like that. And I think in that respect, that that also outlives the the you know national party phase of of the populist movement because farmers cooperatives, I mean, continue to exist well after the you know the populist movement is officially declared dead. And you even see in the depression, I mean, Herbert Hoover, the first thing when he comes in to again deal with the with the problem of debt. I mean, the biggest problem you know is over overproduction, high debt low crop prices. I mean, he tries also to kind of create some, some sort of, you know, capital structure where the farmers can, can, can continue to engage in these self-help 
um, farmer cooperatives, of, you know, storing grain, making loans, I mean, negotiating rates with the railroad company, I mean, all those things. So, so in that sense, it, I think the populist movement in the West builds on that strong base and then, and then, you know, has the greater ambitions, but doesn't completely, I mean, nothing ever completely just ends. You know, we like in the textbooks, it ends, <laughs> turn the page, <laughs> right. new <Okay>. error, <laughs> new error. <laughs> but doesn't like just end. I mean, things still, uh, still can still continue. We just stop paying attention to them. I think where it definitely ends is in the South though. I think the South, they kill it. I mean, I, would, I think it's harder to find as much of a legacy there. Um, but the problems, as you pointed out, are so different in the two regions of the country that it's um, and the new and the you know again fast forward to the to the New Deal, which you know to me the New Deal is always a kind of picking up of the populist progressive agenda. I mean, okay, here now here we here we go again, right? So now what can we do? And if you we were just talking before we got on about art, but if you look at photography and you look at Dorothea Lang when she does this sort of broad survey around the country of all the agricultural problems. And again, we focus on the Oki, you know, so-called Oki photographs out to California, but actually she spends a lot of time in the in the South and and in the in the Midwest. And you know, she's really documenting that in different parts of the country there are different agricultural crises. And a lot of that reflects different socioeconomic um, uh, problems or structures. And, and therefore even, and so fast forward to the depression, I mean, to the new deal, when you're trying to formulate like a federal response to that, in fact, you help one area, you hurt another area, you know, that it does not. And that's where I think when the populists jump from regional to national, they falter because it's easy for, you know, they, so they oh something in here for everybody. Well, we all know that's like every political party's platform and it never works because you're like well i don't like that and i don't like that, like that but i do like that that <laughs> right. and that but what should i do and so the yeah it just it just it's not it's just a very hard i think to have that kind of cohesive um sense of identity um within a within a political party around those issues as a political science i mean so you know jennifer's a historian so she cares about like you know things like facts and truth <laughs> Um, but you know, as a, as a as a political scientist, we like generalizations and stereotypes. Um, and the uh, you know the our typical explanation is is that you know you get this realigning election in 1896, where McKinley def definitively defeats uh, Bryan, and um, and and really af after that point, right, the populist right really can't make uh, can't make any inroads right the the republican party really really cements its um uh, a, a, a bond between northeastern manufacturers and monopolies and labor and at that point right they there's just no way that they can compete and it's and it's out of those uh you know, post 1896 republicans that you find a lot of progressive um uh, uh you know leaders and uh politicians right so uh, I remember years ago when I was first learning about these things, how surprised I was to find that it was the, the, the Republican Party was the was the party of progressivism uh, initially. But um, so, uh, by the way, let me just say, I think both of you have done just an absolutely fan. This is the clearest I've ever been able to think about this as a result of of the successes and failures and why of, of, of populism as a as a kind of movement or, or party. That was really, really great. Um, so I'm not sure if you want to move on then to sort of segue to progressives a little bit and how maybe where they pick up. But before we do, if you don't mind, there's a question uh, from Michael I wanted to raise. By the way, if you can see the questions, I'm not sure if you can see them and you see one that you'd like to just go right to and answer, please feel free to do that. But Jennifer, you, you were bringing up, uh, both of you talked about the, um, the problem of race and uh, Michael raised a question about um, feeling among populists uh, with regard to gold, uh, perhaps as a sort of symbol of, of, uh, of Jewish influence. Do you, have you come across any of that in reading about the uh, populists? I'm just sort of curious. Um, yeah, yeah, if you can demagogue a religious, racial issue, I mean, you know, they'll use anything, right, uh, in, order to, in order to create a I mean, you know, the, the way the demagogue works, right, is, is that you got to create a majority that's, that's terrified of a particular minority. Right? Okay. So okay. that's, yeah, that's a fairly common uh, yeah. strategy used uh, both in the uh, West and then the South. 
Okay. I think it's not, it's, we're not in Father Coughlin uh, territory yet, but okay. I think that it, you definitely see all the references to usury. I mean, definitely you can, you can, um, you know, read that, I think, through an anti-Semitic lens and, and also the heavy emphasis on Christianity. I mean, we think about the social gospel. I mean, it is a reiteration. And we have that reading here that this is a Christian nation based on Christian values. And we've lost some of you know, our way in terms of um, incorporating those values into our daily behavior and how we structure our society. And the, and the solution there is to get back to that. So I think in that, in that sense, at least from the readings that we have, but, but certainly like um, you know, Tom Watson had no problem just going there. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so they'll have some demagogues who don't, who can be more explicit about it. But then again, to me, this is, these are important roots for what we see moving forward. So when we, we, we see like Father Coughlin and again in the, in the 1930s, like, again, just, you know, outright, like this is, you know, this is, this is the Jewish hold on Wall Street and the banking industry. And this is what, this is what's caused all these problems. That that he's building on a on a um, a legacy and speaking to a community again that could easily have generations who were part of the populist movement. I mean, we, mm. we again, I'm going to go back to how we kind of teach American history or understand it in these segments. But people in 1935 didn't just like wake up and say, "Oh, I wonder what America's like." I mean, if you're 50 years old in 1935, you could have memories. I mean, or you're in your family anyway, you know, some sense that this rhetoric and this, this understanding is, is just common, the common mm -hmm. way that you look at the world. So, yeah, so I think we can yeah. definitely yeah. agree on yeah. that. I mean, also too, right, the, uh, in, in terms of the rhetoric, right, you remember, right, Brian's famous line, right, uh, after his Telluride, at the end of his Telluride speech, right, is mankind shall not be crucified, right, on a cross of gold. Yeah. And uh, that, so, uh, you know, you very much invoking, right? Uh, and this, this is a, you know, this movement is endowed with a certain religious purpose, right? You see that in James Weaver's call to action, right? You want to endow right. it because this, you know, this is a big moment. I was going to address too, there's a question uh, Melissa asked, right? About what is this kind of argument, right? About bimetallism, right? And the silver. So the, it's a really good question because it's. It turns out it was actually a much more complicated thing for me to understand. Also, too, I'd always assumed Brian was kind of um, sort of a simpleton about economic and things because he always kind of has sort of a rather simple solution. Actually, he had a very sophisticated understanding of currency. Um, I, I mean, uh, it, it turns out right. Also, too, he's you know we always kind of uh, he's always kind of made fun of in terms of his. Um, uh, uh, creationism and things like that, but he had actually a very sophisticated understanding of the Bible as well. And um, in terms of currency, right, though, this is from my understanding how it works, and that is why, so the argument for silver is not that you just want a cheaper version of um, uh, cheaper, uh, cheaper hard um, uh, rare object, right, to attach the money supply to, what you want is if the international standard is, is on the gold standard and you adopt the silver standard, you can manipulate the value of the currency. Um, and so that's right what, what they want. And then bimetallism right, was actually what McKinley proposed as a way of trying to triangulate the different, the different parties. And so that was actually an effective strategy, but it contained one qualification. And that is we wouldn't adopt bimetallism unless the international community adopted bimetallism, which utterly undermined what the populists were trying to do. So it was a very clever <laughs> tactic. That's, so and, he could he could call he could want it, but no, it was never going to happen. Right. Right. That's brilliant. And Sorry. I would I would just um add that in a you know for a common man perspective in terms of you were saying you know that this was I mean I always find it interesting when I'm talking to my students about this that you know you talk about free silver and you think and you really you know why would an average person glom on to this like what is it what's in it for you so um with an unsophisticated understanding of of, <laughs> of currency and I mean a lot of it had to do with debt and so I mean, right now we're in an inflationary moment and to us inflation is the enemy because we just see prices going up. But for a, but deflation can also be, have, be a very negative um, thing for people, especially people who are in debt. Because if you're in debt in a deflationary moment, then, you're, then you have to work twice as hard to pay back money that you, that you borrowed in an inflationary time. And 
And again, this is a moment where people are coming off of the civil war and war times are great moments of inflation. And, and so you have this sense that the banks are making money off of you because you are paying back debt in, in, in currency that basically can buy twice as much because of the deflationary moment. And so this insistence of kind of, um, you know, sticking to the gold standard for an average person, it makes credit harder. It, 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 it probably, it makes it harder for you to pay the money back. And I think for a lot of farmers, farmers are in debt. I mean, this is part of the, of the problem that they continually face is this, this debt cycle. And so credit prices matter to them. And, and there's this sense that if you just free up the currency, then all of this is going to be is going to be free flowing, and it's gonna it's gonna make things easier for you. And to me, that's another important element of it in terms of of um, not thinking of you know thinking about it in a kind of bread and butter way, as opposed to okay, here's the the way the currency will work in the international trade arena. I which has always raised a question in my mind. I I don't. I, I know as a, as a panelist here, we should have answers, but I, I do have a question too uh, on this. And that is, are you, when you look back in this era, people are, you, you do see there, people have a very clear notion that they want inflation in order to be able to pay back these loans. All right, but then you, you never hear anybody today going around saying, oh, thank goodness for inflation. I owe so much student debt. Now I can finally pay it off. So I don't, <laughs> never understood why is there a clarity about the benefits of inflation back then, but today it doesn't seem to be, I mean, you got a lot of people in debt, but you never hear anybody saying, well, there's an upside to inflation. <laughs> <laughs> Jennifer, do you have an answer to that? I, I, are, I think that extended me, but that's, that's it. That's me with economics. <laughs> <laughs> that, is a, that is an interesting question. I was just going to add too, and I, I know you both already know this. In fact, David, I, I, learned, I remember learning this from you number of years ago, you and I taught a course on uh, progressive populists and progressives together in our master's program. Uh, the rhetoric of, of silver is it allows them, uh, lead, the populist leaders, including Brian, to sort of demonize, um, you know, the wealth, the class, right? The wealthy class that has sort of cornered the market and controls the gold. And that then that, that somehow becomes the source of the problems. It translates into the source of the problems that that, uh, that ordinary people are feeling across, especially the Midwest. So that's the rhetoric, of course, that's, that's the other benefit of silver, but that's a rhetorical, not an economic um, uh, um, factor with regard to that. So. But I do think that it is, it is important that in, you know, again, we're, we had a, we've had recessions for sure, but these are people who are living through great peaks and valleys with the economy, yeah. right? Where there's just right. these ginormous crashes. And so the, the idea, um, that deflation and this crash can really be negative and negatively impact, you know, your livelihood. That that I think is very present in people's minds, and and we um, we definitely. I mean, again, I keep I keep raising the 1930s. I'm not trying to make this something about the Great Depression, but I mean that you th you see it at these moments. What's the what's the answer? They're pumping money back into the economy. I mean, you got to pump money back into the economy. We just went through this, right? We come off of COVID. Um, all, all this government stimulus, it's like, let's just, you know, push money into the economies, then inflation is going to be the results and, and how much inflation is good inflation, how much of it is runaway inflation. I mean, these seem to be, you know, just our constant efforts to, to get to that, that perfect equilibrium. And so, um, but you can demagogue anything, even high inflation. <laughs> so it's not hard there, to do. There, there was a serious argument, right, for for uh, silver standard. Um, I have a sense of this because the um, uh, Friedman, right, who was a uh, you know part of the Austrian school, who were all about you know um, uh, a, 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 a solid currency, right, and pegging. Um, uh, money to the gold uh, to the gold standard. You know, even he argued that, in fact, it would have been a good idea during that period of time to loosen up the money supply mm -hmm. and yeah. adopt the silver standard. So there was actually some sort of serious argument, as you pointed out, right during this period about loosening up the money supply. And wasn't the federal that was the the ups and downs, the peaks and valleys? That was a, a prime motive for the creation of the Federal Reserve, if I remember. Yeah, exactly. Right as well, exactly. Right? So, okay. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Right. Uh, good, great stuff. Um, 
So I thought I had another question here. Oh, um, progressive. Sure. You're never going to talk about the progressives. <laughs> well, this this may be a seg. This may be a segue. more boring than the populace. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've got these really flashy, like William Jennings Bryan. You know, he's he is flashy and he's he's a, he's an interesting, lively. Well, you don't want to talk about Woodrow Wilson. <laughs> you should, uh, <laughs> Not flashy enough for you. <laughs> he's he's pretty he's pretty even keel. Right? Uh, I just learned, by the way, I didn't realize this that Wilson apparently did have a pretty decent sense of humor. I always took him. Every photograph you look at him in, at least when he was younger, he, he uh, before he was president, yeah, you know, he was a sort of jovial, likable fellow. Um, anyway, maybe we'd get to that eventually, but. Uh, I was, because every photograph you see from Wilson, he's That's yeah, he's, he's, he's so <laughs> serious. Right? Around that. He's in, uh, but um, I don't know if maybe this would be a segue question. This is from John. I, I don't know if either of you can or want to speak to this, but I think he's asking: um, Is there a kind of parallel to the per, per populist progressive moment in history, if you want to call it that, in the United States? Is there a parallel in in Europe or some other country, or is this a unique American thing? That arises from sort of unique American circumstances and maybe uh, sort of unique American perspective on on politics, democracy, government. That's kind of a big question. So I just didn't know if either of you wanted to. Well, I would say yes, for sure. In fact, the progressives drew a lot of their inspiration from Europe. I mean, they uh, you think about Tolstoy. Um, and Jane Addams, you know, in her in her autobiography, 20 Years of Hull House, talks about, you know, this pilgrimage she makes to Tolstoy to kind of understand in Russia, you know, how he's trying to live with the people and create these cooperatives and, and, um, and uh, value, you know, labor by hand. And he, she has this great, this great encounter where she's just mortified because she visits him and he looks and she's wearing the, a fashionable dress and she has this sleeve that has a ton of fabric and he like picks up her arm and looks at that fabric and like just and then like literally from that like from that point won't talk to her because you know she's so frivolous and it it's sort of this this spiritual awakening for her that she's been born into privilege and she has to do something with it and she's been frivolous and not not really um aware of the you know of her the response, social responsibility that she has. And, and I think that, um, and Toynbee Hall, which is a, the, the first settlement house, but that's in London. And she goes and visits that and looks at what they're doing there and then comes back. So I think that the idea that progressivism is, is in fact an international movement and that there is a lot of cross fertilization intellectually and in terms of methodology and even people literally crossing the Atlantic and and visiting that that that's pretty well established in literature now and so while there are things and and I think that a lot of the progressives sort of see in the urban areas what's happening as not so much the importation of problems from Europe, because of course a lot of it's connected to immigration, but more that America prides itself on being exceptional and there's something unique about the American uh, promise and experiment. But we're going to lose that uniqueness because industrialization is bringing exactly the same thing is happening here that we've seen happen. So we go to Europe to to kind of for cautionary tales. And if we want to preserve what is exceptional and unique about America, we have to we have to get on this now. And that again goes back to the idea of class conflict. That if America becomes a permanent caste society in which you're born into a class and you never can you never can rise, then we have in fact turned into Europe. And that is. Um, you know, connected to a lot of anxiety about the so-called closing of the frontier, about the idea that, um, yeah, that, that immigration is just um, creating um, unassimilated po urban urban enclaves, which are which are diluting our sense of common purpose, and and I think that this is is. So there's a uniqueness, but it's, I would say that it's a sense of the, the fear of losing our uniqueness that motivates especially a lot of the urban-oriented progressivism. Populism, I mean, there's certainly agrarian, um, agrarian, no, is that is that a word? Agrarian, <laughs> sorry, agrarian. <laughs> <laughs> it's, I, it is a little okay. early for me here. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> sorry, yeah, you're. Sorry, I was going to say that. 
usually pretty articulate, but that one, that was a sip. <laughs> um, uh, agrarian movements in Europe as well. And so I wouldn't want to say that it's, you, it's just American, but I don't, I don't know. And maybe you guys do of, of the same kind of intellectual exchange connection with populism and European agrarian movements. And maybe that goes back to David's sense of that. You know, this, is, this, this is not really a sort of strong ideological movement in the sense of political theory. It's, um, whereas po progressivism is, I mean, if you read 20 years at Hull House, like parts of it are like really almost unreadable. It's so dense. You know, David probably loves it because it's a lot of political theory. I'm like, let's get to let's get to the anecdotes. Like, yeah. let's get to some stories. Um, and so that movement's very, very um, thoughtful. Yeah, it's it's difficult to find an analog in in Europe for the populist movement because, you know, the the populist movement acted like it discovered a tension between the rural and uh, city life. Right. I mean. European politics has always been a tension between rural and city life. And so there is no, in, in some ways, there's not an analog to that, but certainly there is in progressivism. And progress, the progressive era actually marks a major transition in the way that we think about our relationship to Europe. Um, you know, prior, prior to the progressive era, Americans had always conceived of themselves as being forward thinking, right? Being, you know, more cutting edge and that Europe was backwards. And in the progressive era, Europe becomes the model of forward thinking, right? And we're the backward uh, thinking. Um, and pre predominantly, they're thinking of these various um, uh, reforms that take place as kind of compromises between socialist movements and capitalist movements, you know, after 1848 in Europe, um, where, you know, you don't, you don't get state socialism, but you get kind of collective program, um, you get uh, social programs, right? Like uh, uh, insurance, right? Uh, health insurance and um, pensions, right? So the, the uh, in practical politics, the progressives really, you know, use those as models of forward thinking. Um, the other thing is, is that you get the establishment, right? About uh, a little bit before this of the, of, uh, uh, PhD or doctoral programs in the United States that brings over a lot of German intellectuals. So German thought, particularly German historicism and idealism, uh, begins to inform a lot of intellectual thought about American politics, and that's where progressivism uh, really gets its root. And it's and it's predominantly rooted in the idea that you know there are no that that, that you know there are no permanently fixed truths, right, about politics, like you see in the declaration when it claims, you know, human beings are, it's self-evident that human beings are created equal, and that these are the fixed truths of all time. Rather, right, um, political life and its ideas work out in stages over time. And so that closing of the rest of the frontier is a key moment, right, for the progressives, uh, because it marks a stage in the historical evolution of America, such that what's happening now is so radically different from the past that our old ideas can no longer inform the way that we conceive of our po uh, politics uh, in the present. That's for, that, This is really great. So uh, progressives, American progressives did adopt the language of socialism, right? Um, but I, but I, my, I always get the sense that their understanding of socialism was not exactly the same as that European sense, in the sense that it's socialism versus capitalism or some uh, clashing and compromising between the two. Um, uh, it's, yeah, I mean, it's e socialism with an economic component to be sure, but it's but it seems like for American progressives, socialism means something bigger. Like they're interested not just in reconstructing, if you will, uh, an economic system, but changing society in in other important ways. Ways that will bring it uh, on a point that you were raising, Jennifer, bring it more in line with this idea that there are social duties that we owe to each other. Right, um, and that those social duties yeah. ought to sort of permeate, uh, not just on the nat not just under national regulation, but again, even on the state and local level. Right. So. Um, I I think I would push back a tiny bit on that, just because I think that first of all, progressives are really hard to nail down as who's a progressive. Like, what is what is what is progressivism? Progressivism is really um, Taft. 
Taft was a progressive. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Right. That's, so that, but that's exactly Taft, like yes. which progressive yeah. are we looking at? Because it's a kind of catch-all term for a host of of associated movements that all are kind of driving in the same direction, but really take as their issue or even as their coalition of partners, very different, different approaches. So when you're talking at the national level and you're talking about, um, you know, presidential progressivism with, you know, three progressive presidents, you know, you know, Roosevelt, Taft, Wilson, very different than if you're looking at, at, at local level, you know, the drive to end child labor, uh, minimum minimum hour and uh, wage laws, um, safety conditions, uh, the moral hygiene element of it, you know, the, the anti-vice campaigns, um, economic um, issues. So it's 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 so hard for that's what makes progressives and sometimes so daunting because it seems like it's so eclectic um, to a certain extent. I always when I have to talk about you know so then what actually makes it progressivism a, a, a cohesive movement? I actually see them as sort of looking at two negative consequences of inaction. And the two negative consequences are one, the monopolists just keep on going and pretty soon we're a plutocracy and democracy is dead and that we can't even pretend that it exists. But the other is a revolution and a revolution that is spurred by whether it's socialism or anarchism or eventually Bolshevism. And, and that, that is scary too, because the progressives don't like things like strikes. They don't like it when the railroad shut down and they can't get around. They don't like it when there's violence in the streets. These are middle-class people for the most part and they want law and order. They want to be productive and they want individual accountability. They're big on values. I mean, a lot of these readings are about values too. And, and the elites have lost the values and, and the workers, you know, everybody getting everything equally. They're not for that because they see a lot of sloth and a lot of alcoholism and a lot of people that don't have the character to um to make something of themselves and and a lot of those people they're willing to kind of put aside so i think that to me they're i always say they're kind of looking for a middle class paradise <laughs> they just want good schools good parks i mean i mean clean streets uh, no disease and efficient government and 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 so that they can kind of have a law and order uh, you know, peaceful place uh, to live. And that's, that's to me when I have to put it together, how I sort of see these different threads. But again, depending on the, what you're talking about, there can be a coalition of socialists, trade unionists, progressive reformers, and sometimes also elite women. If you're looking at issues that, that involve women, I mean, especially about um, uh, maximum hour, working hours for women, you'll see a, a very interesting partnership there where some of the, the wives of the wealthiest people in the country are in common cause with socialist trade unions organizers to protect women in the workplace. So it's not so easy to just characterize it as progressives against this group or against that group, because depending on what issues at hand, there can be some kind of unusual um, partnerships that we, that we see. And th thanks, Jennifer, for that. I think that was a really great clarification. Um, when, I, when I referred to them as socialists earlier, I guess my, what I was trying to suggest, you said it much better. <laughs> was, I mean, there was a formal socialist party. Yes. Right? And, and progressives <laughs> didn't want anything to do with that because the, of the reasons, I, many of the reasons you were just talking about. And, that, and your point about trying to prevent the violence that they saw uh, emerging in Europe over an inability to solve the economic problems and the social problems uh, was something you're right. I think they really wanted to avoid. And that would be part of that idea of, of, of not just their idea of a middle class paradise, but that tied into this sort of idea of American exceptionalism as well. So, but we can they do had examples of violence do. here. I mean, you know, look at Ludlow, the Ludlow massacre or the Pullman right. strike, or I mean, just uh, I mean, there's plenty of there's plenty of, vi of labor, you know. Uh, violence here and most of that is either um you know strikes the um companies have their private police forces i mean right. um, think of homestead the homestead strike or ludlow you know the the, the the troops come in so the idea like you say that 
we're replicating the patterns of Europe. I guess my point is they don't just have to go to Europe to see to see this violence. It's at they're actually experiencing right. it here. And it's disruptive and it's scary. And are those, is that what you want to have happen? Is that the solution? That's where I see with Weaver's interesting in his thing, because he's hinting at that in, in this populist treatise, right? That like if you don't, if you don't do what we want, what's the answer gonna be? And it probably won't be things stay the same, but people get angry and they'll rise up. <laughs> And that's, that's a big fear, that it could go another direction. So doing nothing doesn't just mean that the status quo remains, that if you get a bunch of you know, angry proletariat, <laughs> and then by the time you get to the Russian Revolution, well, then there's a clear you know, danger signal about, about what could potentially happen in America. Point. Also, too, Jen, I mean, Jennifer's point about trying to thread the needle between plutocracy and, um, and socialism, I think is really an important point too, because the, in, in this sense, right, if you look at uh, like, for instance, Eli, right, uh, uh, he's a great example of somebody, right, who's trying to stave off socialism through mm -hmm. progressive reform. And so a lot of the progressives would often formulate their progressivism this way, I'm forced to be a progressive. Because in order to preserve American values, we have to kind of really radically rethink uh, American values. It's a kind of uh, paradoxical nature to it. And so if you look at Eli, for instance, right, uh, you know, his argument is not, right, we, we need to institute state socialism, right, but rather we need to reform some of the practices that lead to the greatest inequalities of wealth so that we can go back, right, to a more egalitarian democratic society. So, you know, his reforms are actually very specific, right? Um, inheritance, <laughs> right? Graduated inheritance taxes, right? Because, right, you, what you, and the reason for those inheritance taxes is to restore that sort of bourgeois capital virtue, right? That, uh, uh, you know, people who inherit too much, you know, don't work hard. Yeah. So if you want to, if you want to restore capitalism, you got to, you, you, you got to get rid of inheritance because otherwise it undermines the virtues that make a competitive market society work. The other person who is a great example of this too is Jane Addams. Um, if you look at her piece on wh why uh, women should vote, it's a very conservative case, mm -hmm. right, for, uh, for women's suffrage, because her argument is uh, essentially not a call for the liberation of uh, women, but rather, right, if you want to preserve the domestic life, right, you've got to be active in society because we don't live in a society anymore where you can just concern yourself with domestic affairs because your domestic affairs are interwoven, right, with the larger fabric of society, especially in these industrial towns. And so you have to become involved in order to preserve the domestic role that you envision for yourself. And what that kind of illustrates is that in order to preserve these traditional values, we have to start rethinking our traditional ideas. And that is, we're no longer a society where we can be self-determining individuals uh, indifferent to what's going on in the affairs around us. Rather, the affairs around us are controlling our lives and now we have to become involved. We have to care about the common good first in order to preserve what we care about even in our own private homes. So it's interesting that the progressives are a kind of mixture of conservatism, right? But also too, with a reevaluation of past, uh, of past values. And I think just to build on that, um, a lot of these pieces also give you um, the sense that the people you're trying to help may be opposed to some of your ideas. And I think that Jane Anna's piece is, is really genius because what she's really speaking to are the immigrant women who are saying, why do I need to vote? I don't need the vote. I don't care about the vote. I mean, this isn't one of, you know, men have to agree to give women the right to vote. That's how it works because men have the political power. So a lot of what you see is sort of, you know, ways to, to convince men to do this. And one of the anti-suffrage arguments was women don't even want the right to vote. And, and, and she's really saying to these women, this isn't going to make you less of a woman. It's not going to make you less of a wife. It's, I mean, because a lot of women, especially in the immigrant communities where she is, they have very traditional notions of what, what their gender role is. And so how do you 
operate within the existing role that somebody has has self-identified with and say, this doesn't change anything about you. It's not turning you into a man or making you deal with men's issues to, to actually have the right to vote. And, and even with some other progressive reforms, especially ones that have to do with child labor, maximum hour working laws, you see it's, it's working class people who also object to these, to these restrictions on, on their freedom. Who challenges child labor laws? Sure, industrialists challenge that, but so do parents because they need that money. And they say, I, I need my kid to work. I worked, what's wrong with my kid working? He's gonna work, he's learning valuable skills. They accept a lot of the kind of traditional um, arguments that are in favor of child labor, that this is a beneficial thing for, 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 for working class families. And you know, when they look statistically at working class families, the greatest chance for working class family in that era to buy a home is when all kids are working. Um, and when they when they get of age and they start having their own families and they leave, family income goes down. And so a man who thinks he wants to buy a house has to do it when the kids are young and that and he controls that income. And then that's going to be the, the the big jump moment for that family in terms of social mobility. And so I just think it's interesting that we um, we don't really have that voice here in these readings because it but it's because it's really the sense of we know what's good for you we have the solution we're going to help you it's our social responsibility but sometimes the people on that on the receiving end of that help have their own ideas about about how they think things should go and so there's resistance in pockets and it's successful I mean Lochner v New York which you know sh shuts down those you know Supreme Court ruling that shuts down maximum hour loss for men in non-hazardous position, um, positions. I mean, this comes from a, from a small business owner who's got a, you know, a bakery in New York. It's not, this is not like some huge monopolist who's challenging that law. It's like, you know, a guy that's baking bread every day and, and, and it goes all the way up to the Supreme Court. And so that, what I, I find is interesting that there's this, and that's, I think, one of the blind spots of progressives that they really feel like they have the answer. And, <laughs> and we still see that today. I mean, that I think is, we, are, we deal with that a lot in terms of the kind of pushback against um, liberal progressivism, small p in our own society, this idea that, you know, the, what do I say, the latte driving, B, BMW driving liberal who thinks they have all the answers, um, but do they really understand um, the communities that they're, you know, trying to, trying to help. So that's sort of tied to the, I mean, we talked earlier about the elitism of, of progressivism. It is a kind of intellectual elitism in a way, as we were saying earlier, but, but still, I mean, what I find interesting about the three, uh, three other um, uh, progressives that, we, that we've included readings from here, uh, Adams, uh, Ely, and Rauschenbusch, the, uh, they they, I think, very clearly understood. Tell me, uh, you know, if you have thoughts on this, please. That that you know, there are some things that can be done through legal or political processes. But again, as you were saying, Jennifer, you've got to persuade the people. You've got to persuade the public. Um, that look again, time things are changing, circumstances are changing. This is now. We need to rethink these things for your good and for the public good, right? And Jane Adams, I know, did a lot on the local level to teach, to educate. Um, and Rauschenbusch and Ely, both, by the way, I meant to mention, why are we reading, who is this Richard Ely guy? I'm glad to see he's in the readings because he's, he's, he was forgotten for a long time, right? I think is a, but, a, but he was a very important, um, a, a big influence during the progressive era, partly because of his economic thought. I had to read his book on contract law in grad school, which was, I'll just say, one of the most unpleasant things I had to do, but I did it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and it was, an, it was an important book because it, re, it was rethinking contract law. But, all of, but on the other side, Ely, like Rauschenbusch, were very, um, um, uh, you know, strong presences within the, the, the social gospel movement, right, which is another way to reach people yeah. and teach them and try to get this new um, message out, right? So, um so you might talk a little bit maybe about the, the, the ways in which, um, and Adam, was Adams associated with the social gospel movement? I should know this. Yeah, Adams, right? uh, it really comes out in a piece uh, that she wrote called The Subjective Necessity of the, of the, That's social, it. Yeah. Of the okay. Settlements, right? That is, is that, you know, it, it's not just um, that you're reforming things so that your material life is better. 
you're, you're doing this right because this is what you owe, right? Your, your fellow human being. And um, you know, uh, uh, Ely was very much influenced, right, by, by, by Rochenbush, right? Who's kind of really the founder of, the, um, uh, of, that, of that social gospel movement. And one has to really kind of see how radical his, his vision was, right? Um, and that is, um, you know, like part of his argument was that uh, Christ's sacrifice on the cross was not an atonement for the sins of mankind, but rather a, a model of self-sacrifice, right, that sh should be imitated in, in political life. That's, that's what he was trying to give an example, uh, uh, Christ was trying to give an example of how we should all behave in political life. And so the, the kingdom of God is not something to be, you know, pursued in the afterlife, it's, it's here and now, right? And that's the divine mission that we have in terms of reforming all these inequalities and, and, uh, and corruption, right? Is we have to get over that individualism to see that the kingdom of God is to be established here on earth through by prioritizing our service to our fellow human being over anything else. And so if you look at Ely's reforms, right, they're primarily all geared towards enhancing, right, our duty towards our, our society. So why do we need graduated inheritance taxes so that we can uh, establish better public education? You know, building up this, the city of God here, right, is, uh, is ultimately that, that, that it's a divine mission, it's not. So the, the best uh, illustration of that is the um, YMCA. Not the YMCA today, right? The YMCA today has become sort of a bourgeois workout place like everybody, everything else. But the old <laughs> YMCA, the old YMCA was founded on the social gospel movement. Right? And, um, you know, it, it, was, it, it wasn't just to, you know, give you uh, an opportunity for exercise or camps in the summer. It was to transform your understanding of the world, right, from one that was individualistic to one that was communal. And so if you go to older YMCA places, you'll see, right, this is that it had this sort of divine mission, right? And it was training from youth to see the world, right, not in terms of things like individual rights and self-determination, but rather in terms of your communal duty to your fellow human being, to building the kingdom of God on earth. And I would say that uh, just to build on that, that um, it's a notion that individualism has turned into selfishness. And you can protect individualism, but you have to, we have to arrest this sort of selfish turn. And, you know, the idea of the Gilded Age, so we have a new series now on the Gilded Age that's, uh, you know, the Julian Fellows has just launched. Yeah, I just started watching it. It's very good. Uh, but that sense that the opulence through which the new elites um, and even old older money are, you know, the, the extent to which they are creating these palaces and just this ex the way that they are squandering this excessive wealth in luxury and selfishness, that this is, besides the economic injustice aspect of it, it's a it's it's denigrating the moral structure of our society and how do we get that back? And how do we get back to the sense that um, there's social responsibility and those who have been successful probably bear the greatest social responsibility. And so, and I think in that you see people like Andrew Carnegie who, um, and even Rockefeller eventually, who start giving their money away and start engaging in these very public philanthropic enterprises in part, I think to stem this criticism that they're receiving, that they that they are that they 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 become that they're they're inculcating selfishness as the prime um, uh, value in American society, self interest, and there's no way for democracy to survive in that in that framing. So the sense that the progressives are not, I think. Well, they don't. They they want a, an environment in which many can be successful. But that sense of social responsibility is really important. Public service, um, that that is that's that's an ethos that we see carrying through um, 
well, until the until the First World War. And in the First World War, the progressives, you knew I was going to get the First World War into this conversation oh. in some way. <laughs> I was I'm hoping like, you well, would. I'm almost out of time. <laughs> and I really better get it in now before we close, because it's impossible to have any conversation with me and not talk about the First World War. But if we think about think about some things that happened in the First World War, this idea of like dollar a year men, these men who come in um, to run different, these new federal agencies, say the Committee on Public Information, which is the biggest one, you know, which is the propaganda machine. And you're going to, these are people who are wealthy. And so they come in and they're going to get paid a dollar a year. And I mean, there's just so many of them. And this is the sense that Herbert Hoover, who comes in and runs the Food Administration, and this is his first big kind of public service um, uh, enterprise after after having found the Committee for Belgium uh, relief when he gets trapped in London and realizes that there is a, a refugee crisis going on and steps up. He's an unknown quantity. He's an engineer. He's a businessman. And he decides to, to organize this international relief mission that's that's extraordinary in its scope using his skills to address an immediate issue that he sees. And I think that it's that that value structure that a lot of the progressives are worried is slipping away. And that's, and social gospel to me articulates it beautifully in a very explicit Christian way, but it animates the entire movement. And again, I think it's a great way to try to connect the dots about many things, many efforts that seem very disparate and different. And you take that crusading notion and again, Let's let's talk Woodrow Wilson and not just Federal Reserve, not just progressivism, but look at, you know, the war to end all wars, the war to you know make the world safer democracy. I mean, this is this is crusading language, and he's kind of extrapolating from a domestic progressive rhetoric, a new foreign policy agenda for the United States, and so it and that carries through till today. So these are these are big concepts that I think are not just ones that rest in this period of time, but at what how much individualism is too bad is is too much because it ventures into just self-centered selfishness of you know what's good for me is all I care about. We still can, we're still grappling with those those questions for sure. Okay. And also progressivism does, it, I mean, it, in some ways, right, it has a difficult or a kind of drawback in the fact that, in the fact that it is not socialism or plutocracy or capitalism. One of the benefits of being a capitalist or a socialist is you have certain doctrinaire things that you can just say and repeat and you understand pretty simply. But progressivism emphasizes pragmatic approaches, right? Seeing what works in practice and then adopting it. But the problem that you have there is that's not really a sellable political formula, right? We're going <laughs> to pragmatically approach this and see what works by trial and error. And so infusing it with some sort of messianic rhetoric, right, gives you a sense of purpose without committing yourself to any particular doctrine. Yeah. Um, and th th this very much reminds me, you know, like um, in the Obama presidency, right, uh, Obama's approach was we're, we're not going to, uh, you know, we're, we're going to get away from these ideologies, we're going to be more pragmatic, which, but then on the other hand, right, there was this real messianic rhetoric, right, we are the generation we have been waiting for. So the thing is, is that you, in order to be kind of pragmatic, which means not being doctrinaire, you've got to still sell this with some sort of religious rhetoric. And I think that's a kind of a, a, a common formula of progressivism is combining the boring pragmatic approach to politics with something that inspires, which is that resort to a sort of uh, language of revelation. It is a kind of admirable like combination though, like technocrat and <laughs> messianic figure. I mean, like not a lot of people can pull that combination off. So you have to, you have to you have to sort of, you have to sort of appreciate that. <laughs> Herbert, Herbert Crowley, towards the end of his book, right? This is kind of the Crowley's Promise of American Life was sort of this kind of major public intellectual uh, book, book foundation of progressivism. And towards the end of the book, he tries to describe the future bureaucrat as Saint, as a, uh, uh, as a Saint Michael, right, with the sword of <laughs> salvation. <laughs> Okay, that's religious imagery for you. So yeah, that's, that's great. Yeah, yeah, so this has been really fantastic. Um, 
and again, I apologize, we are coming to the end of our time here quickly. So Dan asks, in light of some of the things that you were both just saying, given Wilson's internationalism, would, would that suggest that populists were more nationalist and progressives more internationalist? Or is that too broad of a, a brush to paint them with? Any thoughts on this? Uh, well, the, uh, so uh, Jennifer would know more on this than, than I would, but the, uh, you know, you know, at the end of the day, right, you got to give William Jennings Bryan a, uh, a, a cabinet post. And so, right, Wilson made him Secretary of State. Oh, that's true. Uh, yeah, I forgot. About I mean, that. the thing <laughs> is that populists are about as isolationist as you can get, right? And so, you know, out of a sense of uh, integrity, right, Brian had to re had to resign that post. So this seems to me an issue where populists and progressives did not see eye to eye. It's a great. And point. I guess I would say too that it's also you know when you think about the farm economy and the war being a moment at which the foreign trade and the ways in which we sell to Europe become a huge you know, growth engine for the farm economy that the, the farmers themselves just also have to face the realities that they are part of a global trade economy. And it's not, they're not just growing for the, you know, for their local area or even the domestic economy at a certain point. And I think that that, um, even though populism as a political movement doesn't really seem to venture into that territory, that it's it's increasingly, if we look at the legacy of the populist movement, this is not something that can be ignored. And I think that's uh, um, like the tariff issue. Like let's let's talk about another snoozer, right? <laughs> like that, <laughs> all these fights over tariffs, but that's a recognition that we are part of a global economy, and we and you see, you know, that's, I mean, you know, Democrats die, and you know, you know, are they 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 succeed and, and fail on the tariff issue. And that's, so that is again, something that at least in the public consciousness connects you to a broader international um, agenda. Well, and also the, the favorite, right? Populist proposal always, right? Was the McNary Hogan bill, which is to have the federal government buy up the agricultural surplus and then just dump it on the international market. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's always kind of way out. This is a terrible, terrible idea, right? That's that's great. Well, we, we have come to the end of our time. I'm, there's so much more I'm sure we could talk about, but I, I just want to say, I mean, to everybody joining us, I'm sure it is just obvious um, that we have two really great, great thinkers, great minds, and you have explained a lot to us uh, in very, very clear ways, and I'm I'm deeply grateful for your time. So thank you both very much for, for doing this. Um, look forward to the time. Hopefully we get to do it again. Great. All right. So, weekend. Thank you, Appreciate thank it. you very much. Bye, everybody. And uh, to everybody else joining us, thank you for your great questions. Uh, just a reminder that you'll receive an email with a link uh, for your certificate of participation. Uh, if you enjoyed the uh, discussion today, the webinar today, please look into the other resources that Ashbrook provides through tah.org. Uh, we have other webinars on Wednesday evenings. Um, we have uh, in-person seminars through Rediscovering America. And also help us spread the word about these things, if you don't mind, through your social media. Um, tell your colleagues. Any way you can spread the word helps, uh, helps um, us help other people um, to think about these important things. So our next Saturday webinar will be March 5th, and we'll be discussing parties and candidates in the progressive era. Until then, take care. Thanks. Thanks again for listening. You can learn more about our documents, programs, and resources for teachers and students at teachingamericanhistory.org or tah.org.